What if people could come to terms with their mortality and think about how they'll be remembered by their loved ones and family? Welcome to this Friday episode of your Designing Your Legacy podcast. I have the pleasure of introducing you to Salvador Buscemi. He is the Chief Executive Officer and co-founder to Dandrew Partners, a private family investment office, and has managed money successfully for almost 20 years through the creation of multiple portfolios into various cross-asset platforms. This includes Dandrew Partners Encore Ventures, the Dandrew Partners Fine Art Enhanced Income Credit Fund, and various commercial real estate and special situation direct investment allocations. In 2008, Mr. Buscemi also launched two separate successful distressed credit platforms backed by a $2 billion New York City-based asset manager and a $1 billion commercial real estate investment manager. Welcome, Salvador. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here, Angelina. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for joining. I believe you're on the East Coast in Florida, maybe the Miami area. Yes, yes. Lovely. So to start out, is there anything I left out of your background that you'd like to touch upon or share with the listener? I think um, one of the later initiatives that we've been working on is um, this investment platform we put together called HRN. And HRN has focused more so on, um, of all things, earlier stage life sciences um, companies. And we've had tremendous success doing that. And that's part of like the legacy and the legitimacy of like the investors who go into that that we'll be talking about are really looking to, to get into. Uh, a lot of people... When, when they equate cancer, they think, um, you know, there's a lot of emotion and everything. So we've been able to bottle that up and, and make it much more impactful. That's lovely. That's lovely. Yes, I, I looked on your Instagram profile and you definitely have a heart for the, um, the cause around cancer and bringing awareness and remedy to that. So let's dive in because mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to read your book, which I'm going to provide an Amazon review very soon. And, Thank um, you. Yes. And you mentioned um, the differences between the middle class and the, what I would call the upper class, the affluent, the ultra high net worth and so forth. And they mm -hmm. have different ways in looking at their legacy. And a part of it is their resources and their, their means to mm -hmm. designing a legacy. So I wondered if maybe you would start out with kind of your overall assessment of what's involved when someone is investing versus speculating. I thought maybe we'd dive in here. I think, you know, if we were to take it from a top end view, Generally, you can tell the size of someone's legacy is by how big it is in the obituary in the newspaper. And for the middle class, it's usually very short. But for those who've gone on to make huge strides in humanity, the arts, the sciences, or society in general, are usually the ones that have the most consequential legacies, right? And those are the ones who have memorable names, and now that's been forever branded, right? Think about it. Michael Jackson died. What happened after he died? His sales of records went up. That's part of his legacy. Um, immortality is something you must earn. And then think about it, Elon Musk doesn't need any more money. Um, he's doing this just for his own legacy. I, I, honestly, I mean, but these guys get bored and they continue just to continue to build and it's something that's in their DNA. If you look at Donald Trump, he was a developer from Queens. He wanted to go over uh, the bridge and build a class A office in Manhattan because he wanted the glory. Same thing with Sheldon Adelson. He affected uh, policy from DC to Jerusalem you know, coming from a very arduous childhood in, in Boston. And the middle class really can't afford to today because of inflationary pressures and low interest rates for years. A lot of these families are now over leveraged and are losing money with inflation. Um, you know, you learn too that it's not good for America as a whole because countries that have a strong middle class usually prosper and last long. And that could be, you know, part of America's fabric is falling apart. Family isn't much of a priority as it is south of the Rio Grande today or as it is in Europe. So for the American middle class, their legacy is really the successes of their children. And, you know, if you, if you look at the upper class, um, you know, it, there's a different value system, to be honest with you. Like a lot of those people would want to be buried with their designer shoes, but it isn't really till you hit like the eight figure mark until you look at things a little differently. Like what else am I here on earth to do? Um, how do I want my epitaph to read? Will my children have considerable influence like the Rockefellers? or they have to toil in the operating business and never evolve. So these are the things that families of consequence think about on a, on a daily basis. Thank you for shining some light into that. I think a lot of the times people on the outside don't know what those dining room conversations are or those closed door meetings and kind of how uh, an individual who is affluent looks at their legacy. Like you mentioned before, you know, if they have enough money, you know, what is there then? What is it that they yeah. look forward to? What is it that they're going to 
build and put their time into. So one mm-hmm. of the things your book mentioned was that the middle class, especially the speculation today, you have you have a few uh, opinions about Bitcoin in terms of the dopamine hits. Do you want to just speak into that for a moment? Because a number of my listeners yeah. were under age 40 and they love Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency landscape. Yeah, I mean, I think if if you're to look at the people who were gravitate if who gravitate towards that, um, they're they're mostly speculators, and it's the problem is because the middle class is conflicted because you know they've been told to like put away and squirrel away savings like Warren Buffett and one year one day you'll be a millionaire by putting it all into common stocks, right? So you got to think about like who's paying for that advice to the public, right? Usually the people who sell the advertisement or the other thing is, is that they're, you know, they're playing diamond hands day trader and they're, you know, swinging for the fences on stocks and they're buying all these meme stocks. The problem is, is that nobody really takes the time to, to, to um, really educate themselves as to what it is that they're investing into because they see so many people that have success. They're like, well, you know, it's me too and fear of missing out. Unfortunately, you know, there's been issues that affected the middle class that forced them to do this implicitly and that's been low interest rate, which is basically a tax on savings. And then also we have inflation too. They know this, as I said implicitly, so they have to swing for the fences, but they don't have enough time or money if they're working a day job to really amass enough wealth. So high income earners, such as those in medicine and the trades especially, um, you know, you see this a lot where people are just getting involved into speculative asset classes. And you got to think, what is Jay-Z buying? He's buying sports teams. He's not waking up one morning and saying, you know, hey, you know, Beyonce, um, this guy, you know, day trader 24 says he's going to be putting his entire IRA into Dogecoin. You know, I think our time has come, you know, let's follow this advice. Of course not, because the wealthy don't see that really as a legitimate asset class, you know, the, as a store of wealth. It's not something that they, it, it's, it's, it's the, the people who have gravitated towards it are just mostly speculators and usually rightfully so because it's coming into its own. And usually it's the, the younger generation that, that caters to that. Um, but it's not something that, um, that that a lot of people that I know really ever got involved with because they knew at some point, you know, your wealth was a bookkeeping entry that everybody agreed on until suddenly they didn't. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things your book also mentioned is the 2012 Obama's uh, Jobs Act. It stands for Jumpstarter Business mm-hmm. Startups, as well as the Glass Steagall legislation. And so all of a sudden that removed many of the constraints to speculative investing. And it almost Mm -hmm. gave this idea perhaps to the middle class that now they can have a bit of, I might even dare say the American dream, even if they don't have the time to do the due diligence. What say you? Yeah. You know, I've recently moved. This is an interesting question. Um, There's no such thing as a free lunch and there never was, and there never will be. You know, And if you, if you were to, ask your financial advisor about this stuff and he's not smart enough to figure this out, then maybe you need a new financial advisor. But the problem is, is that um, it it invited a lot of people to, who weren't experienced enough to be able to get in at a low barrier to entry in businesses that they had no rights really to invest into. And and really what it comes down to is, um, you know, the, the, I, since I've, you know, been in this business, you see a lot of pitch decks they are all pretty and the ideas are great but the people behind them are not. And it's their first time. And when we invest in things, we make sure that our CEOs have multiple exits, hopefully unicorns or billion dollar plus valuation. We, you know, because of our networks that we have, we're able to invest in best in class operators. Whereas the middle class, middle America doesn't have that. Technology has given it and, 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 and Obama was a genius for doing this. However, the unintended consequences is that um, you know, that's the time that Shark Tank came out and everybody thought that if you have an idea, it's going to blossom into something. We're really, the idea is really the horse. And, and as a business, you got to be investing in the jockeys, especially if you're doing things like high risk venture finance. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of times people look at the get rich quick and they don't realize either they have to be surrounded by their like the absolute best team or it's uh, going to take a, what is the expression? Um you know, about the overnight success. It only took me 10 years or 20 years to become an overnight success, right? But I'm bummed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no. I, and, you know, it happens, but, you know, everybody's wired. Everybody has that greed gene. They just express it differently, right? Absolutely. So your book, I might say, lays out some bare naked truths. Like it just comes out almost like a New Yorker. 
and says some some very useful truths, but blatantly. So I, mm -hmm. I, I was curious, what was or what is the intention of your book? Is it the education piece or kind of what was in your mind when you looked out and you saw the landscape, whether it was the next gen or? I, I saw the landscape and I knew that there needed to be a way to sort of I was telling the same story over and over again. And it was usually, it came across this way. It would be usually a female says, Sal, I've read your investment letters. They're great. Congratulations. I have no idea what you do, but what is this that you were talking about, about some family that you were working with that put their name on the side of a library in California? And now all of a sudden you start to have their attention. And so this book sort of explained how truly, and I don't say the 1% because the 1% is, you know, really just about most Americans today on bi-coastal cities, but the 0.001%, the 1,000th one of 1%, the what decimals. their motivations, yeah, the decimals, what their, exactly, that what their motivations and drivers are for doing this, right? And what I wanted to do is like take a lot of myths, be entertaining about it, of course, because I don't want to be boring in a book that's, you know, that's not a good Amazon review. Maybe say some sensationalistic things, but then also corroborate with current large families and investors that I've known who are some of the largest in the world, well-known names and some former colleagues and bosses of mine at my old investment firm and other places too, that there's a huge difference between, you know, the decimals and, you know, the 1%. Yeah. The other thing you mentioned, and maybe this is what had you earn the respect of your clientele and investors. You took, you talked about this concept of protect the King. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you know, we are all courtiers in some point fashion in life. And um, there's a lot of evolve when you're it, it entrepreneurship is self-development and disguise. And one of the things I've learned from my mentors is who to protect and who not to protect. Right. You always protect your investors. But sometimes other investors get kind of upset with CEOs and those CEOs, you know, sometimes they're doing the best they can, but other investors get impatient because their needs were mismatched or they didn't understand the investment or they thought they'd be out sooner. And that can cause a lot of harm to someone with a great reputation. And what, what happened is, is that I was called in to actually, there was going to be some sort of coup on this. And I told him I would not support it under any other means because this person was a legend. And at the end of the day, I knew exactly what I was doing is that I was protecting the king. Right. And that's exactly what you do because I have an investment in that too. And I didn't want to see his reputation get hurt, but I also had a lot more understanding of what was going on behind the scenes. And these investors probably should not have been in this deal in the first place. They weren't my investors, but they were just outside investors who were trying to make some noise. And you got to use discretion when, you know, when you're dealing with people and make sure that, you know, the people who you support, you have to really support, you get behind them. I love all of my CEOs. Some of them are more successful than others. Some of them are Nobel Prize winning uh, laureates in, in oncology. However, you have to make sure that, you know, you outline the boundaries of the relationship with the investors before going into any of these deals. And most sophisticated investors know that. Yeah, very much. Well, I just wanted to speak into the loyalty component for a moment, because it seems like these days, some people either understand the loyalty in relationships or they're just switching racehorses every other yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've become much more transactional. Um, the middle class is much more transactional. The the upper middle, not the, you know, the 0.001%, they're much more relational. Yeah. Well, very much so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I wish it was less transactional, whether it's the luxury market or the fads here today and gone tomorrow. And yeah. Anyways, thank you. Thank you for speaking into that. So one of the things I also thought was very um practical to speak into is something that maybe the middle class might not know about. And since today's affluent um, are two thirds self-made, I thought this was a very good distinction. The distinction that you mm -hmm. made is oftentimes the wealthy use influence or what I might call OPM, other people's money, whereas mm -hmm. the middle class will look at their personal residence and say to themselves, well, I'm just going to pull some equity out of my house. And, but that's a, that's totally and completely less leverage than if somebody pulls together their contacts or builds out their network. This is why people worry about their legacy. Is, is my son ever going to have to make a cold call one day? Really, really wealthy people. You know, think about it. I mean, I'm being a New Yorker and I'm really laying it out on the line here, right? You know, or, you know, is he going to have to do something else? 
networking is most important here and it's undervalued because we live in a very isolated society today because of technology, right? And you're sitting next to each other, you're texting someone else. It's so important. And it's so important. It's the reason why celebrities went to jail trying to pay their kids their way into expensive schools. It's not so much for the degree, it's for the network and for the pride and legitimacy. And if you don't have a strong network, it's going to be prohibitive you. It's going to be very prohibitive for you to really see the type of investment opportunities that are out there. Um, and we have a society called Clavis Society. And people, you know, if they will give you a link later to that, that we can talk about. But if you're the richest or the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong place. Yeah, very much so. And yes, I will include a link to the Clavis Society in the show notes. Absolutely. And I think one mm -hmm. of the things you spoke about was back in the day, Goldman Sachs had a network and they vetted yeah. their people and there was a uh, an exchange of deals and people knew that the deals would be good and not chopped around. And I think when you're pointing to this idea of a club or an organization, it's again, bringing together a network of people where everyone knows they can trust one another and not be worried about, gosh, you know, has that paper, that medium MTM note been shopped around and, or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> gosh, that's a throwback, but yeah, that's, that's funny, Angelina. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little bit true out in the marketplace these days. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And people might mean well, but again, it's it's that understanding of can can there be, and, and you call your organization the Clavis Society, but again, it's this idea of how can we bring together a group of people where we know that the intention, the intentions are good. And I think the way you have said it is that the values are aligned. Yeah. If you look at it, I mean, we've become very polarized as a society and social media has just, you know, added to that, that wedge and added a lot more distance. However, people still want to gravitate around people. We are, you know, we are humans, we congregate. And, you know, at the highest level, these people like to congregate with people who are like them or want to be like them. And these are people who usually have the same concerns and, and issues that they have, but they're aligned in values, right? And what that looks like is that everybody understands that everybody has an alignment of interest. And the more, um, you know, transparency there is, the easier it is to work with people because then people start to see something, they trust in it, they believe it, and that's how you build a culture. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I didn't include in the list of questions, and I'll just briefly touch upon it right now so that that's fine. people sure. can go and buy your book, but you had mentioned uh, there's four or five different avatars and the the uh, practical brilliance of that is knowing what is it that drives you? What is it that drives someone else? And if somebody can write down and you lay this out in your book, just a brief impact statement and have it on their phone, just, I mean, in a mere seconds, they can pull out their cell phone and understand what is it that drives them? Is it to have their name on that side of the library building or is it you know somebody that is interested in the arts locally because there's different motivators that drive different individuals based on their personality types and you're nodding yeah and it, it comes down to status that's really what it is it's comes down to how they want to be perceived by other people and even you know i get into the book and we talk about certain people that drive certain types of cars and what they look like in real life and everything but that is really true and the representative is is they invest in the things that match their personality, their demeanor. Um, if they're a very wealthy accountant, they're not doing much other than just real estate, boring real estate, um, because that's their demeanor. I'm not going to show them anything that we're investing into, such as life sciences, because to them, it's beating a dead horse. There's, there's, a, there's, you just don't want to offend anyone by showing them something that you know they would not likely to be invested into. And it's just common sense too to know your to know your client and know your friends and, you know, going on a you're not going to bring her to an oyster bar. And it's the same thing with investing too. And that really is part of the relational process of in, in, in practice is not bringing your girlfriend who's allergic to shellfish to a oyster bar. Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I just think it's uh, important because you had mentioned before entrepreneurialism is almost like an exercise in personal development. And I think when somebody knows themselves better, they know what they value. And I think that's a part of the this conversation also when designing when, in designing one's legacy in that they have to kind of do that inner work and understand what is it. Yeah. And I know mm -hmm. that's not new sports and weather. And either somebody can either get a coach or join Clava Society and have those deeper conversations where they can un mm -hmm. unpeel, uncover, discover what is it that drives them so that uh, they're not just, 
saying yes to every deal out there. Cause I think sometimes if somebody, especially new money coming up, they don't know what it is that they really care about. It's that fear mm -hmm. of missing out that you spoke of earlier and they could say, yes, I want to invest in, you know, fill in the blank. And yet, you know, like, I think you made the point, like if they're against guns and then Smith and Wesson approaches them or something. Yeah, no, exactly. You have to have your impact statement written and, and, and people are like, well, what does that mean? Well, it has to have some sort of tension in it, right? Like if this doesn't happen, then what happens? So people are really looking at that and their impact statement is really, it could be just a few lines, but for some of the families, some large families, um, they won't invest in anything unless it has like a 40 year impact, right? Or, you know, over long, long term. And that is, they can afford to do that because or they've been set year. up to do that. Yeah, 50 year, absolutely. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's so very cool. So tell me, why do you think affluent individuals and families are caring more about their legacy today to craft it intentionally? You know, it's a it's a good question and it sort of gets into the woo-woo-ness of the book. And when this was written during the pandemic, I had to address certain things. Thankfully, I have a great friend who was able to help me in that chapter. But before I get into that, really what happened is that the the pandemic changed the way people looked at their own mortality in a way never before, because we've never been so lonely and isolated through technology. And then the pandemic just forced people to either better themselves or not evolve. People were thinking, if I die of this horrendous COVID outbreak, will I have left the earth a better person? And in chapter seven, actually, there's an old family um, that's very, very runs parallel to the Rockefellers and I tie it's it a, together. Yeah, I just, yeah, just the, want to interrupt for a second. It's a very sobering moment. In the last few years. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. It yeah it's a, a very sobering moment. Yeah. And so in chapter seven, I interviewed Dr. Aaron Fall Haskell. She's a doctor of divinity. And she has a legacy that, as I said, runs parallel to the, to the Rockefellers. And I actually did get a Rockefeller to sort of bookend that. But this is nothing new for humanity. But this is the first time that we've been thrusted upon this, like a heavy barbell across the chest during probably like the loneliest times of all of humanity. And that's what's caused a lot of people to resort to drug use, you know, um, alcohol abuse. There's a lot of issues that came out of that and a lot of people did not come out alive. But through the resurgence in, you know, the, because of this, there's been a resurgence in spirituality, not necessarily religion, but spirituality that I was talking to Dr. Aaron about just recently. And that's continued to, 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 to um, continuing to grow as people are continuing to want to become much more aware. And it, it might have brought in some sort of what she thinks is a spiritual renaissance for some. And I would tend to agree with that. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I think one of the other things that you had mentioned is there's also this um, succession regarding trillions of dollars that's going to be passed down. So there's this next gen that um, are out there and they've got tremendous pressure on their shoulders. And you talk about perfectionism, um, you know, it's kind of like, don't mess up. Don't mess up the family name <laughs> while you're out there. Yeah. <laughs> no, really. And it's a it's a big deal. It's a you know, you're that guy, right? You're that guy that put money into the weed stocks and lost it all, right? I mean, that's not saying that that's a bad investment, but this is like some of the conversations that go on behind closed doors. Which is again why I think this this podcast episode is so important because if people want to say something or they have a question or it's like, where do they go? And again, if somebody's not talking about this at Starbucks, and like you had mentioned, in today's isolated society, given, you know, what are we going to talk about this over Twitter? It's like somebody needs to have a little bit more context to know that there are some other individuals that are realizing that this conversation around legacy is beginning to enter the public consciousness more. And there are some individuals out there that can help kind of guide that. So they're not mm -hmm, alone mm -hmm. and feeling like, oh, my goodness, like I, I'm expected to do something brilliant. But um, like yes. you said, the next gen, they don't have that user's manual and dad or mom that built the company, you know, they put in those 80 to 90 hours a week. And now there's this expectation that whether it's the sons or the daughters coming up, that they're supposed to fill in those shoes. And if you dare mess up and make that family look bad. Oh, oh, oh. oh absolutely. Yeah, no, it, no, I never, <laughs> no, I'd rather walk naked down Broadway than to have to, you know, deal with anything like that. And unfortunately it does happen. And you know, we saw a lot of people take a lot of risk because they thought that they were smart by getting rich quick. And some, somehow in society, getting rich quick denotes huge intelligence to people. Um, it'll always be that way. But, you know, th people move on and people improve and people evolve, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So before I move on to the next question, there was a, an expression my dad used to say growing up, and it was that the difference between, um, well, I don't know if I should say it out loud, but what the heck? <laughs> He used to say that the, the difference between um, 
kind of like old money and new money is values. And mm-hmm. I think what he meant is that somebody can get rich, but if they don't have the values, then it's kind of like, eh, like. <laughs> yeah, then you're, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's true. I mean, we see that today. Um, you know, it's, if you look at the people who buy the most Rolls Royces, it's a nouveau riche, you know, it's the person who just got into it because they're getting accustomed. They haven't really evolved yet, but they do evolve once their wealth grows. And then, you know, they're able to use their influence, their intellectual influence or their family brand to sit on boards, to be able to raise money for them. And to realize that their values matter because sometimes exactly. Yeah. Sometimes if, if, when they were growing up, if they didn't have the discussions that their values mattered at the dinner table, they might not even realize that, again, that no. they need to know their top five values. And if it aligns with their lifestyle, not only can they have more freedom, fulfillment, and satisfaction, but they can design an amazing legacy. So um, mm-hmm. in certain landscapes, one's reputation is their currency, and investors sometimes need to put their egos aside. So yeah. You mentioned um, having the generals on your side because they have skin in the game and they're worth their weight in gold. Can you speak into this a little bit? I think, you know, it comes down to, you know, managing the expectations of investors. Everybody's got a lot of money today. Everybody's more flush than they've ever been, um, perhaps since, you know, the beginning of, of humanity. When you think about it, trillions of dollars being pumped all over the place. Middle class homes going for a million dollars. The life, the, everything has changed today. And so comes what comes with that sometimes is an attitude. And, you know, he who holds the gold makes the rules. However, when you're dealing with people who have much more sophisticated investors than you in the deal, there is no room for anyone to come in and really um, have a voice. You just invest and you watch and you follow along. And I think today the best way to get any sort of MBA for anyone um, looking to get into this business is to write a check into a world-class company, invest into something. If you have to become a part of it, that's fine. But if you invest in something else where you're much more passive, um, where you don't need to be a part of the process, and and that's largely going to be a lot of it, you can still follow along. You're going to find out that there's going to be a lot more for you to learn by keeping your mouth shut. And, you know, we have one investor who's a crazy life science investor. He always wants to be involved in everything. But the problem is he has too much time on his hands. So we have to outline the relationship with him and say, look, you, you do not have a PhD. You do not have uh, seven unicorns under your belt, you know, IPOs or sales. So why don't we just let this guy do what he does best and stop calling him? Is that okay? And that, you know, and sometimes you have to be direct like that because, you know, it, time is money. And, you know, you have one investor and it's usually the smaller investors that do this. But, you know, it, it, if, if you do have the opportunity to invest in these circumstances, you should be along for the ride, um, but you should also be following along too. And if your investment manager is like things that we do, we have a very interactive community. And our investors like to see the emails and the good news emails we send out all the time. Even if there's bad news, we send it out because it's part of a learning process for them. You know, it's an experience for them because they've never been able to do this before and they're looking to, to learn a skill, which is buy side private equity, venture capital or real estate. Um, that, you know, they never really had the opportunity to learn because they either just sold a business or they were doing other things in their life professionally. And that's really what, you know, if, if you're working with someone in this and you're writing checks for that, that is something I think that you, you know, we believe in our value system that we deserve, you know, is the interactivity. On the other side of that is that I write a lot of emails personally. And if you unsubscribe from my email, you know, and you're, you know, I don't like that, right? Because, you know, <laughs> you know it, it's the interactivity, you know, I don't take it personally. But, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, I haven't gotten an email from you lately. Well, you haven't opened them up and all of this. So we always make sure when, we, when people, they get a welcome email from us saying, welcome to HRN. Currency is the new, you know, interactivity is our new currency. If you don't like emails, unsubscribe now. Let's stop it. But you're going to be in for a great, you know, a great ride because you're part of the story now. Yes, absolutely. Coming from the book. Coming yes. from the book, yeah. Yeah, I think that your book talked about that uh, interconnectivity and also just authenticity today being a form of currency. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because anybody can be fake. I mean, there's so many emails I receive from people and they want to sound like they're institutions and it's like, dear colleague. And it just, it bothers me. I'm like, oh my gosh, like nobody's really evolved and, you know, everybody thinks it's all transactional and, you know, it's, it's painful sometimes, you know, I, I, I'm in Miami and there's, there's a lot of founders here and the founders don't really have the, 
the bedside manners, if you will, yet. And, you know, you all know that you're going to be pitched because somebody makes an introduction, you meet this guy for coffee, and he has an iPad under his arm, and you know you're going to be pitched, right? And it's like, really? Like, you're not even going to, like, you know, buy coffee? Or, you know, not. I mean, it's like dating, right? And I think, you know, that's something that people really need to understand is that um, you got it. This is a relational business. The higher you go, the more relationship it is. The lower you go, it's more transactional and hustle and and Gary V. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that's a very important insight because sometimes people can get their feelings hurt or just look at that. Uh, the short term, I think there's a, a metaphor. It's called WIIFM. It stands for what's in it for me radio station. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. 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 And sometimes yeah. being able to put that aside and realizing, well, if I'm looking at this from the long term, maybe Sal says no today, but if I can build that relationship and business, then mm-hmm. one day that, that, that trust, that rapport will be there and you'll listen to my yeah. great idea on my iPad. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Right. But not on the first date, not on the, you know, like, uh, you know, you know, you know, and he starts going through it and you see, oh my gosh, you're number 11 of 43. And I'm like, all right, look, I gotta, we gotta, we're gonna stop this here. Just email this to me. I'll take a look at it tonight on my iPad when I'm in bed. Okay. He's like, oh, okay. Okay. Tell me about yourself. All right. And then that's how it goes on. Well, I think you're, what you're referring to is that realness. Yeah. Tell me who you are before you reach into my pocket, please. <laughs> it's like, Oh my gosh. It call it, it's called being French fried. If you've ever thrown a French oh. fry on the beach, all the seagulls come after you and just, choo, choo, you know, just absolutely, you know, fight over the, the French fry. When you go to conferences, there's a, there's a famous life sciences healthcare conference sponsored by JP Morgan this week that I did not go to. Um, and not only because I had my own conference here with investors in Miami, um, where we, where I am today, it's because I didn't feel like being French fried. Like if you wear a certain badge, and here's a funny story in San Francisco, Uber drivers pitch you because they all drive from all over the country to drive people home, CEOs or investors in order to get jobs, careers or to raise money. So it becomes a very exhausting purpose, you know, mentally trying to be polite sometimes to people who are constantly pitching you things. <laughs> very much, very much. My dog was just barking. So I had to mute out for a oh, moment. Yeah. Wonderful. So, yeah. So, um, the, I just want to bring up a hot name for a moment before I ask you about your personal legacy. So mm-hmm. Trump, uh, he marketed his name. Wise decision? Mm-hmm. Did he plan for it? Your thoughts? Oh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful decision and everybody should have a personal brand. That's where we're going today. If you look at it, if they add it in social media, the metaverse, what is your personal brand? What do you stand for? How are you conspicuous in front of everyone? Right? How do you agree? How do you attract people of your peer group? Right? You put a you know, you say you like Ferrari or something, whatever it is, that's what we're gravitating towards today. And I think he did a wonderful job doing that. Um, and it helped him tremendously during the election. Very cool. Very cool. So since this is a legacy podcast, would you speak mm-hmm. into how you see that word and also what you mm-hmm. would like your personal legacy to be? You know, I'm turning 48 in two weeks. I don't have any kids. I'm currently not married. And right now, my legacy and my work really is to make an impact, mostly through the life sciences investing, because nobody likes investing in life science companies. Nobody wants to be reminded of biology and chemistry. It's the hardest thing really to raise money for. But through my, you know, because of my network and, you know, the salesmanship and the influence and everything, I've been able to do that and really bring a lot of families who wanted to build a legacy, but didn't really know how to do it and the appropriate appurtenances, if that made sense. And we've been able to really put together and charge forth on things because it would be great to be part of a cure or a therapy or even a new tool to fight some sort of disease meaningfully and substantially. And that would be great, not just the financial benefit, of course, but to leave my stamp on something that approved the lives of thousands, maybe even millions of people. So that's really what, what it stands for for me right now. And it's really, you know, it's really, I think, a function of... Um, it's a function of what you, it, it takes a lot of introspect, to be honest with you, to look at it. But if you do the work and you look at it, um, it makes it that much more easier to get out of bed, look at yourself in the mirror and say, we're doing this. Yeah, well, you're doing something good for humanity. Because Correct. if you could do anything, you could invest in NASCAR. But really, does that lift up humanity and their evolution Correct. and progress and so forth? Correct. Correct. And if there's, a, there's a certain amount of courage and bravery to 
um, to put money and write a check into an earlier stage life science company. But if it's done correctly, like any other company we would invest into, you're investing in the people and you know their track record because their track record goes over several economic cycles. You're not just doing it passionately. You're doing it more appropriately and thoughtfully. Yeah, that's lovely. And I also know you have a value around education, which is why you've written a book or two in order to yeah. share the knowledge. I, I do. I, to me, it's like a side hustle, right? I like, I like writing. To me, it's very therapeutic. I've had a lot of people ask me to write books on things. Um, my latest book, I love very much, Investing Legacy. It's, it's beloved by everyone um, because it's sort of like the inside voice that everybody knows, but they never really had the courage to ask. And I just put it all, you know, out there, but it's sort of like more practical significance than just something, you know, written in a flowery, um, you know, prose. Like it's very, I've written books on real estate investment management and raising capital and, and, um, you know, investing legacy is more of like a um, salacious look into, you know, much, much more allegory into the look, the one thousandth of the 1%. And I was able to really use my network to put this together um, and and it really opened up a lot of eyes to a lot of people because it sort of confirmed many of their suspicions. Yeah, it's very much so. I think one of the things you said is uh, the expression money is to be used, not spent. So I think it's those tiny insights that if somebody can step back and just reflect on, it's a new perspective. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, some of the other things like the power of networking also has a value. There's a price to it, right? And that takes time and it also takes resources. If you look in the book, um, there's a family that I profile and he spends more time than a diplomat on the road. 224 in 2019, I think he was on the road 222 days all over the world. He loves to travel ashore, but his influence is worth more than any power. That's the level of commitment that it's not going to be get rich quick. It's those uh, cultivating of relationships. It's showing up again and again to mm -hmm, be in mm -hmm. the rooms and to be present and to do that due diligence. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So what is the best way for any listener to reach you to find out more about the book? I think, you know, as much as I'd like to sell the book, there is something that I put together for your listeners and it was the top 10 mistakes that families have used that have destroyed their legacy. And if you go to investinglegacy.com, it's a PDF. I wrote it myself. It's kind of funny, um, but it'll give you like a good view into whether or not you want to commit to the book. But it is hilarious because I do receive emails from people saying this is the best thing I ever wrote, you know, I've ever seen um, on this because my brother-in-law lost his money exactly in uh, the way you described it in number six. Or someone else will say, I've seen this happen with a family member or friend, and that was number two. And it was all the mistakes people were making because at a higher level, you can't take the same customized 80, 20 advice um, that is, you know, meant for the mass market to be sent all over, you know, the marketed all over with mutual funds and, 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 and the stock market, the things that your peers are investing into are not advertised on TV. And that usually means that the best circumstances are the ones that are rarely marketed. Very much, very much. Thank you very much, Sal. And any other closing thoughts about, you know, what has inspired yeah. legacy, any role models? I, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, what's inspired the legacy actually is not really a happy story, but it's something I came to t t terms with when I had to write the third obituary for my mother when she passed. And when you write three obituaries in life, Angelina, you sort of look at things a little differently, right? And then you start picturing your own obituary. So I would tell people to go to investinglegacy.com first and download the PDF. But I would also have this thought in your head. And what would be, what do you want your kids to say of you after you pass? Are you, are you, are you asking? Or... That, yeah, I am. Yeah. And then craft an impact statement around that. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a real life 101, almost a come to Jesus moment. Hey, hey, you call me a New Yorker. I'm a New Yorker. That's the way we do it. Right. I mean, yeah. it's, how do you want? There's nothing flowery here. There's no woo in it. It's very, even Dr. Aaron, she's very direct in the book. There's no. There's none of that. It's, it's how do you want your kids to think of you or speak of you after you're gone? How do you want your epitaph to read? And when you think about it that way, your priorities sort of come into alignment, sort of like the planetary system. Yeah. Everything just starts to, right? 
And here's another thing. What don't you stand for? What don't you like? If you don't know what you want to be remembered, what don't you want to be remembered for? Start with that and then use that to back into what you want. And that's a great way to start your impact statement. Yeah, I, I found that if the door is open just 1%, it can open wider and wider with these conversations. But initially, mm -hmm. sometimes people, like you had said, they have these conversations in their head and they have their regrets in their head and they know where they've done wrong in their life, but they, they don't yet want to put that down on paper because it's like no. whether it's the emotion's too deep or there's shame or something that's there. So I, I just want to acknowledge that you're asking people to, you know, almost in a call to action, like why not today yeah, get it mm -hmm. done? It is. I mean, again, you know, I, again, I love to buy the book. It's a great book. You'll really appreciate it. It's on Audible. Um, but go to investinglegacy.com and, and, and download it. And after you read it, you'll be like, okay, this is exactly what I don't want my kids to say about me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any of these 10 things. So it actually helps build it because it's a list of people getting to agree what they don't like first in order to think about what they really like. Well, that's good. That's good for the human, for the human psychology. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, I will just say that in closing, you know, thank you so much, Sal, for bringing your wisdom, your character and your high moral standards to be a straight, a straight shooter with this knowledge. Because mm -hmm. again, people want to know, but they don't even know where to begin. And they have, yeah. it's, it's clouded in mystery because we think we're supposed to be something in society other than just to be ourselves sometimes. And yet that is the number one thing that people need the most from us. Oh yeah. No, without question. Yeah. And I think, I think people, I, I think this might have aroused a lot of the spirits and people, um, not spirituality, but a lot of the thinking in people thinking about, wow, I never thought about what my epitaph would read like, or, you know, I've never heard that between my ears on a podcast right now. If I'm, you know, driving in a car with family or working out at the gym, it just brings the thought on, but it also makes it that much more immediate. Yes, very much so. I think it has grown in the public consciousness today compared to a decade ago. And whether that's because of the pandemic or what you had spoken about regarding the isolation and loneliness because of technology mm -hmm. or just people wanting more realness other than uh, the images on Instagram or any yeah. social media platform. Yeah. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Angelina. Thank yes. you so much. I appreciate it. And if you're listening on um, YouTube, please remember to like and subscribe. If you're tuning in on Apple Podcasts, please remember to rate and review. Thank you so much for joining us this week. And thank you, Sal, for speaking into your legacy. Thank you for having me. Thank you.